Let's take a few minutes to talk about how bacterial populations grow. How do we go from one cell to millions of cells overnight when we inoculate a broth? How do just a few bacteria um, that are harmful get into the intestinal tract and over the course of days become a, a biofilm lining the colon and causing disease? We're going to think about very briefly about the process of binary fission, one cell becoming two, and the bacterial growth curve. In other words, uh, what are the stages that bacteria go through uh, when they're growing in what we think of as a closed ecosystem, one in which no new nutrients are being supplied and waste products are accumulating. That becomes important. And in the case of our infections, under most conditions, they really mimic this, this closed ecosystem idea, uh, unless they have access to the bloodstream, which acts more like an open ecosystem. And in the midst of all this, we'll talk about the concept of generation time. So let's jump in and look at binary fission to begin with. <clears throat> Remember, we're thinking about bacterial population growth. Not When we say bacterial growth, we don't mean one cell getting big. We don't mean one cell growing up and going through its teenage years and becoming an adult cell. We mean one cell becoming two, and then two becoming four, and four becoming eight, on down the line until a million are becoming two million, and a hundred million are becoming two hundred million. Population growth. These principles apply both to a flask of bacillus that you're growing in the laboratory like you have on the right here, or an infection like bacillus anthracis. This is a cutaneous anthrax infection that started with very few cells but underwent bacterial growth, population growth by way of cell division. So let's start with binary fission, just the basics of binary fission. You see in step number one, before binary fission can really take place, the cell has to replicate the DNA faithfully. It has to make absolutely sure that it has two complete chromosomes so each daughter cell gets a complete set of instructions on how to be whatever this cell is. When that DNA replication happens successfully, the cell wall and the cytoplasmic membrane begin elongating and extending. The two uh, daughter chromosomes are hooked by proteins onto the membrane and they get dragged out towards the poles like a conveyor belt as the cell is extending and new material is being added on in the middle at what we call the divisome, this structure with lots of proteins that's adding on new uh, membrane material, new peptidoglycan, etc. <clears throat> Once the two chromosomes are completely clear of one another, there are proteins that allow a septum to begin to form. You can imagine, uh, visualize like a, a, a water balloon with a string wrapped around it, and you start tightening that string. As you're tightening that string, you're pinching off that middle section, that septum, and you're bringing the, the, the membrane, the water balloon, closer together until eventually it's going to seal off, and the two can separate once the septum is, is completed. <clears throat> The two can separate or they can stay together and loop back around to step one and start the whole process of division again. If they don't separate before the next round of division, we end up with those sort of classic arrangements that you studied early on of things like streptobacilli and streptococci, chains of, of cells all linked together because they, rather than, than separating, they went ahead and started the next round of division. You can also get staphylococci and, and, and diplococci and diplobacilli bacilli and so on. And that all stems from the pattern of what happens at the end of binary fission. And that's all genetically programmed for a given species, which is why it's predictable for one species uh, or another. <clears throat> the cell can then undergo multiple rounds like you see here, and you get either a colony or um, a broth culture or a biofilm of the various forms of microbes that we see, and we see those different arrangements as well. Now you see in this figure, they've put some times on there, and those times uh, are loose. In the laboratory, uh, E. coli under perfect conditions might double every 20 minutes for you. It's never doubled that fast for me. So 30 minutes is a bit fast, uh, and realistically in an infection, it's not likely to happen quite that fast. In fact, in an infection, it's probably more like one to three hours per round of division. Uh, and there are variants uh, of that. You're going to see some that go faster and some that are slower. But it's not as likely to be 20 minutes per doubling time. Now that term doubling time means how long does it take to go through this, this entire process of binary fission. It's also called generation time, the time for required for one cell to become two cells. 
It's an important concept. So if you've got one species that in an infection causes has a generation time of an hour, that means it's going to double every hour. And you've got another species with a generation time of 24 hours, that means it takes a whole day for every round of division to take place. And it's going to take much longer for the infection to develop. So understanding generation time of different species can be really useful for understanding the progress of an infection. <clears throat> Now I want us to think about bacterial population growth in a closed system. A closed system is one in which no new nutrients are added, waste products are allowed to accumulate, and so the population can't just grow unchecked. So on the y-axis we've got our number of cells, we can consider it a log scale axis, axis. and on the x-axis we have time, and we're not going to put units because we just said it varies from one microbe to the next and one set of conditions to the next. A flask is going to be very different than a wound, for example. But no matter, uh, no matter what kind of organism we're talking about, ultimately all of them in a closed ecosystem will grow in what we call a sigmoidal curve, an S-shaped curve, where we have four stages. We have a lag phase, followed by a log or exponential phase where they're growing as fast as they can, a stationary phase where you can see the cell numbers are not changing at all, and if left in stationary long enough, we'll start to see the number of viable cells declining. So what I want us to do is think about what's happening uh, physiologically. What are the characteristics of the population of bacteria in each of these stages? Let's start with the lag phase. The lag phase happens when the microbes first enter a new environment. So let's say 100 salmonella cells find their way into the intestinal tract and attach to the lining of the, the, the large intestine. All right? They're going to start with a lag phase. They won't start growing and dividing immediately. So what are they doing? The cells that are there are busy sensing their environment. That's really the key. There's a lot of environmental sensing going on. What's the pH? How much oxygen is available? What nutrients that are preformed are ready? And what am I going to have to build for my Self. So the cells are sensing their environment and gearing up to take advantage of the available resources based on their genome, right? If they have uh, a metabolic pathway, a biosynthetic pathway that lets them build nucleotides, who cares that you're missing one of the nucleotides in the environment? It's okay, we can go ahead and express those genes, make those proteins, and build our own nucleotides. Um, if the pH isn't ideal, they're going to have to make some adjustments to their membrane in the wall and to some of their proteins in order to be able to um, operate at their personal best for those conditions. So that's what's happening during lag phase. Lag phase might last a few minutes. It could last days before the cells have actually sensed what's going on and sort of woken up and begun growing. But once they begin growing, they all start growing at once, and they're growing now as fast as they can. Right? We're going from 0 to 60 just like that. And so they're optimized for growth under the current environmental conditions. Right? They've expressed all the right genes. They've made all the adjustments for pH and salinity and temperature and everything else. And now their numbers are increasing by a constant normalized rate. Normalized means per cell. In other words, they're doubling every hour or they're doubling every 5 hours or they're doubling every 24 hours. Their absolute growth rate is always increasing. Because early on, one cell is becoming two, and it took an hour. And then two becomes four, and it took an hour. And four becomes eight, and it took an hour. So their absolute growth rate is very low. It just took several hours, and they're only up to eight cells. Um, but later on in this process, in the same one hour, five million cells became 10 million cells. And so they increased by five million cells in just an hour. So their absolute growth rate is always increasing, getting faster and faster. But their normalized per cell growth rate, in other words, their generation or doubling time, is constant. And it's as good as it's going to get. It's as fast as it's going to get. At some point, however, uh, growth starts to slow down, and it's because primarily some limiting nutrient uh, is running out. Uh, it doesn't, you don't have to run out of everything, right? You can have all the ingredients for baking brownies except one, and you're not going to be able to bake your brownies, right? It doesn't matter how much of everything else you have if one thing becomes limiting. And so something typically becomes limiting. And at the same time, uh, some wastes are starting to accumulate, and the cells are taking on some, some biochemical damage because of that. And so they slow down, and they enter stationary phase. And in stationary phase, there's some growth happening. Some cells are growing and dividing, but at the exact same rate as others dying. And in fact, 
those cells that are dying are sort of sacrificing their bodies, right? They're being cannibalized by the ones that are still living. So the total population size isn't changing, but there is still uh, active metabolism taking place. And then finally, if left in stationary phase long enough, uh, wastes will accumulate to the point of causing irreversible damage to some proteins and membranes and so on. And uh, some of the cells will lose their di their viability. We call this death phase where, where you know, maybe a cell, one cell is lucky enough to find some resources and, and decides to divide, but most of the cells are actually dying off at this point. Um, so there may still be some resources available, uh, particularly if you're recycling old dead cells, but but waste accumulation is becoming limiting at that point. I want you to think through this whole process from lag phase through stationary, through exponential and stationary, and into death phase in light of an infection. Uh, maybe go with the, the Bacillus anthracis anthrax infection from the poor guy in one of the opening slides. And think about what happens when those spores, those Bacillus anthracis spores, first revegetated on his neck and began sensing their environment. They may have been there for hours or even days before they were finally ready to start dividing. And when they did, they grew and divided as fast as they could. And in the process, they were consuming resources in the form of his tissue. Eventually, they, they're going to hit stationary phase. Something's going to become limiting. They're going to run out of a nutrient that's not diffusing into the, into the, the wound uh, all that well, that lesion. Uh, or the immune system is going to get in there and start walling them off. And we haven't talked about the immune system at all yet, but that can also force these bacteria in an infection into that stationary phase. And then over time, they are going to die off, uh, whether or not we can count on that. Uh, to to reverse the damage or to um, to cure an infection remains to be seen, but the immune system at some point often does begin to get the upper hand. So that is bacterial population growth in a closed ecosystem. Let's hit some summary points from this lesson. Uh, most eukaryotes divide by mitosis. Very complex process. Bacteria do not have to go through such a complex process. They don't have organelles in the way. They don't have a nuclear envelope in the way. They don't have multiple linear chromosomes that they've got to separate out equally. They have one chromosome, make a copy, drag them to the poles, and, uh, and create this divisome at the center with all the proteins that can create new material and pinch off two separate compartments in binary fission. In a closed system, a population of bacteria will grow in distinct stages, and those distinct stages have predictable characteristics, and it's important that we understand what's happening in each of those stages. Uh, and that's the end of this, this video. So thank you for joining me. I appreciate it, and I'll see you next time.